no, we don't want birth fevers. We want ponds. We want, yeah. you know, that's what we want because everyone forgets about the larval habitat of insects. And it's the larvae. They're, 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 the, they're the eating machines and that's what's feeding all the vertebrates. Hello, my name is Sasha Dench, but I'm better known as the human swan. I'm also the UN's ambassador for the Convention on Migratory Species. This year, the charity I founded, Conservation Without Borders, is launching a new expedition to follow the flight of the osprey, an epic migration of 10,000 kilometers through 14 countries from Europe to West Africa. As a part of this, we're doing a series of podcasts to highlight the global stories and connections this bird makes, to help us see our complex and challenged world through the eyes of this incredible animal. In this episode, I speak to Erica McAllister of the Natural History Museum, also known as Fly Girl, as we reveal the secret unseen insects that share this vast migration with the osprey, and the surprising connections between ospreys and insects and us. So, hello everyone. My, my title is, I'm Senior Curator of Diptera and Siphonaptera, which are flies and fleas at the Natural History Museum. Great. And me, many people would see the, well, still imagine the Natural History Museum to be about uh, bones and stones, I think you said. But there is now an interest in this current era, which is all about people as well, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, we've had a long history. Behind the scenes is an extraordinary place. And there's many scientists working away there. We have over 300 scientists behind the scenes and a collection of 80 million specimens. And we've always been working on taxonomy and biodiversity and understanding the climate and food security. But now we're really actually saying there is something seriously wrong and we have seriously impacted on the environment around us. So we're utilising all these specimens and all our contacts around the world to actually do some really good research in how we can mitigate and, and change some of the impacts that we've been doing. And that is where very much our expedition and the Natural History Museum's um, ethos combine, because whilst we're obviously following the journey of the osprey, um, we have uh, chosen the osprey for various reasons. Um, and one of those is because uh, along a flyway, we're obviously very connected in lots of ways. It's not only is it wildlife that are connecting, they're flying all the way from, from here to Africa. The ospreys are, many other birds are doing that. Um, but what a lot of people don't imagine is that it's also actually um, the reverse route for a lot of the resources that are coming to the UK. So all along the way, in fact, many of the impacts we think we're going to find on the osprey are actually resource extraction for products that we're actually bringing back mm. here. Um, and I think as we speak further, we're going to find that there are many more connections um, over and above that, which is which is really interesting. Um, going back to the, the osprey and insects to um, start with. We um, have chosen the osprey as a bit of an icon for the flyway. It's very easily visible. Um, it also relies on freshwater and saltwater systems. It relies on forests, but it also, as top of a food chain, relies on eating fish. So it's quite a good indicator of the health of a flyway, which for us is like a string of, a string of wetlands. But how might the state of uh, the insect populations also be having an impact on our ospreys? <laughs> Massive. Um, my PhD was on wetland ecology. I studied insects in wetlands and you they are so fundamental to the ecosystems when it comes to enabling um, trophic interactions that, the, the, you know, so many things rely on them. Lots of things that we don't necessarily think are good, such as mosquitoes and these non-biting midges, their sheer numbers, biomass of these creatures, absolutely fundamental for healthy populations of many of the vertebrates feeding on them. But it's not just that, they do all sorts of other ecosystem services. So uh, again, these uh, non-biting midges, they filter feed, so they clean the system. There's some really great little midge larvae that basically they spin silk webs in wetlands and they filters all the particulate matter through. So they are cleaning up these systems, they're looking after it. And so there's so many different roles that all these insects will be doing that it is, you can't have these systems without the insects. And obviously we're also looking at the more visible signs of climate change along the route to the wetlands that we see, to the human populations, they'll be at least able to, to record, to tell us stories um, of what they've noticed. Um, and they will, I guess, human, sorry, insect populations are also uh, going to be impacted. Yes. 
it's I mean it's interesting we're seeing a very dry time at the moment in the UK and the people are beginning to discuss the impact of abstraction so us taking water out of the environment for our own needs and what is happening on these wetlands and things like that and we are seeing species declining massively they are very suited for their habitat and if we remove their habitat that's it they're gone and what about temperature changes? So on the on the Round Britain Climate Challenge, there was a couple of places where actually the coastal uh, coastal temperature changes were, they were certainly affecting um, some of the mollusks. Uh, but I'm guessing that must also be affecting. Yep. And, and, and climate change is having more of an impact now because, uh, and again, because it's land use change. So you've mm. got these two integrating factors going on. It, before, if you had a, a stochastic event, if there was suddenly like a heat wave, um, a lot of the insects were it was spread out so those that are directly affected may have died but others can move back in to replace right. the populations but we're taking these other habitats away so suddenly they've got nowhere to turn and that's it you lose in these populations so climate change land use change together is really detrimental and particularly wetlands i can't remember what the exact figures are now but like if you look at the last 30 years it's quite high the last kind of 100 years is high but in some areas it's like 90 percent of wetlands wetlands gone um yeah i mean um yeah no i mean we were just i was looking at lowland wetlands uh, across you know thames valley and how many of those we've lost so much of this habitat and these are important filter systems so they, they provide us with clean water they provide us with food they provide mm. us with a natural environment and and yet we're just building on them and when you when you think about it that's that's kind of a case of ha people both here and I guess for our expertise expedition team when they're off in Africa having to sort of put up with the the midges or the insects or whatever and then try and basically we have to try and convince them to look at it as kind of food and pollination and all the rest of it as opposed to being just an irritation that we need yeah. to get rid of. No I mean um, just take mosquitoes for uh, uh, an irritation I suppose we could do. There's three and a half thousand species. And oh, about, yeah. I didn't know yes. that. <laughs> and there's about 150 ones that are uh, truly anthrophilic that like hanging around with us, which is about 20 a mass effect. But the rest, the rest, I mean, they're all really important pollinators and all of their larvae is really important for birds. So in the Arctic systems, for example, 4,000 species of insects, 2,000 of those are flies. Those mosquitoes and midges, they are basically... Mm fodder for all the migratory wildflowers uh, going over. I mean, it really highlights the the ridiculousness of this idea of, you know, completely tidying up all our lawns, for example, drying up spaces because bogs and things are awful, but putting up food, bird feeders everywhere because we really want to have lots of lots of birds. Yeah, no, we don't want bird feeders. We want ponds. We want, yeah. you know, that's what we want because everyone forgets about the larval habitat of insects. And it's the larvae. They're, they're, the, they're the eating machines, and that's what's feeding all the vertebrates. Mm. So you, everyone planting all their plants and their flowers and whatever, it's great, but you're only doing half the life cycle. We need to think about all of it. So we have a hard enough time, for example, with, certainly even with TV producers saying, oh, people aren't very interested in birds, they're kind of flappy things. What they really like are warm, cuddly, uh, furry mammals. Um, I'm guessing you have an even harder time with, uh, <laughs> with insects. Just a little bit. But you do, you do. I mean, take your warm, fluffy mammals. They're all vicious predators. <laughs> they rip animals limb from limb. And yet we seem to kind of gloss over that. I've got a little fly here that's, you know, by day, like the larvae are just going around, getting rid of our waste, they're recycling, doing things we don't like. And the adults are going around pollinating. And they're really fluffy. And it's like, come on, folks. And there's more flies in the UK, more species of fly then there are mammals on the planet. So we have so much we can see, learn and observe. And, and we can explore in our own, anywhere in the world, you could just go out and you've got a little habitat. You can just see so much of life in front of you. And I guess we've, we're obviously looking at the connection of wildlife between the UK and Africa, our kind of this shared resource. We're looking at birds because they're big and obvious. I'd never even really considered insects but you tell me there is also yeah. an insect connection. Well, there are. I mean, we, we uh, have all for a long time known about migrations of, say, like the uh, monarch butterflies across America and Australia. Yeah. And we, look, we know about dragonflies. 
well, there's some really fun research coming out about hoverflies. So you're talking about a fly that big. And these have been recorded flying from Southern Europe, Northern Africa, from the other Turkey, from uh, um, all of those areas into the UK in one migratory event. So they're not pit stopping, it's not multiple generations, these things. And every year to Southern Britain, four billion hoverflies arrive. How on <laughs> earth anyone managed to measure that? I don't know. They, <laughs> I know, <laughs> honestly. Number. They sit there with these radars measuring how many flies are coming through. And I just hats off to the researchers because it sounds extraordinary research. But these are so important when it comes to, because they're pollinators. So as they move, they are looking down, they're able to see relic plant populations in it. and they, they're able to transfer this pollen. And so they're like, it's great. So it's, it's helping genetics, it's good for conservation, yay. And then they get here and they mix with the local population of flies. I always love that. It's like over summer when, they, when everyone comes yeah. over and it's like, <laughs> hi. And um, that they're really good. And this is really good for our populations. And then they lay so many larvae. And these larvae consume about, <laughs> the, the figure is six trillion aphids before they're adults. So they are little biological warfare units looking after all of our crops. They're looking after everything. So they're so, so important. And this is happening across the world. These are migrating everywhere. And we've only just started looking at a handful of species of flies that do this. But the aerial fauna, mm. I, I mean, it, it, you know, the birds must be like, oh my God, there's so much going on. Yeah. <laughs> You've got all sorts of things migrating. They don't need passports. They don't recognize, you know, borders. They are totally off and enjoying Great. themselves. Do you have any idea whether, are they using thermals? Are they going up and they're migrating super high in the jet stream? Are they flapping um, all the way? There's a lot of flying. Some of them, they are, they've just released a paper this week and they're looking at the genomes of them and they're, they're seeing that there's, there's a lot, there's one and a half thousand differences between the local populations and these migratory populations in terms of what their genes are asking do so their flight muscles are bigger and all these sorts of things to enable these little creatures to make it across wow that is but you've you've also got things like spiders up there oh so yes they've been, oh yes yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that because if you fly i don't know i didn't know about flying to africa but certainly flying paragliders and paramotors around at certain times of year you can have your whole paraglider and all the lines are like <laughs> screaming these fine fine yes. threads and early in the morning they're kind of shining with dew it's beautiful they are, I absolutely love watching spiders. They, it's called ballooning and they just, uh, the way they just go. But on, a, on, like, a th on a thread rather than a balloon. So yes, the thread yes. itself is, get, is picked up so by they, the wind. They just release it. I mean, I guess it's because they're bums. <laughs> They've got nice globular bums as they're just like floating around. But you have things like Calembola that are up there. And these are, these don't fly. They, they've just been carried up by the thermals and like, can you imagine just waking up one morning and like, Oh gosh, I'm, I'm in Ethiopia. How did that happen? <laughs> How you flew with the wind? Yeah. Oh, that's that's magical. Uh, really magical. And I wonder what um do you know what roles what sort of roles they're they're playing when they're in Africa, for example? So I mean, I'm I'm thinking about if um if that population happened to be decimated here with um with pesticides, etc. What might they what might, might they be, then be missing in Africa? Just purely in terms of numbers, it's going to be impacting. So um, they um, a lot of them are dying out when they get back there and they overwinter as eggs and things like that. But that is going to be a food source. So all of this is going to mm. play a role. And um, uh, Africa in itself has got some extraordinary insects. You, you've got um, all of these weird things, extreme pollinators in Southern Africa which sadly don't migrate because they have mouth parts that long. Right. And what are they are, pollinating? These are pollinating a lot of the long tube flowers down in okay. the Cape region of South Africa. And they're just extraordinary. But they, there's a lot of these because Africa is, because of the habitat is very old, obviously. And we have a lot of um, very old associations between insects and plants. So they're very, very dependent on really their specific. insect pollinators. Yeah. Mm. Um, and another weird angle on insects that we're going to come across is some of the um, some of the people that we're speaking to across along the way to Africa are looking at potential sustainable food sources, maybe going back to um, other 
food sources that are no longer fashionable, which are insects. Um, what do you know about eating insects? Well, so we or we condone it. No, I, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> and there's there's a there's a black soldier fly. It's obviously always flies. Um, that is basically going to save the planet. This one fly. Um, I may be egging it a little bit, but it's so dramatic um, because these are um, everything about them. They're environmentally um, sensible. So their larvae are decomposers. They're, they're, they recycle. So we can feed them on our waste, our food waste, uh, our animal waste and things like that. So we are getting rid of uh, a lot of hazards, say. So if you had like a compost, you didn't want other flies that may bring in diseases, these little ones eat it and convert it. And in converting this food waste, they then produce, their body are just 40% protein and 30% fat. Now this ratio is extraordinary, <laughs> and I, absolutely amazing. So we can then feed it to chickens, pigs, cows, etc. So you have suddenly a readable, uh, readily available food source that's free. And you can... So and you avoid the this this problem of say not being able to give domestic waste to pigs and things because so um, we have to be careful about um, giving them yeah uh, but if you're going but, via an insect does it remove that well it, they're definitely definitely they're taking this totally so we're doing on um, uh, vegetable matter at the moment mm -hmm. so when it comes on to and and all but we are getting rid of waste but we're not letting that go into our livestock until we're very confident. Obviously, we don't want to be passing on anything. But the probability is quite low because insects are very different to humans yeah. when it comes to their diseases. So the probability, I mean, we eat mammals. We are putting ourselves at risk regularly. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and eating insects is a much, much less risk. Than the, there, were, there was a huge case for eating insects. It's true. So is this a, is this a UK species? I know it's, it's well, it, it's uh, not. It's come from, where was it? It's uh, Hermatia lucians. And it's now found globally. We have um, insect farms in the UK because what we're doing is we're feeding it. Um, there's been loads of amazing startups everywhere. One of them, Enzo Cycle, has just got a big grant to go up to Scotland to do a massive factory up there. Because what is really useful is that we can use it for fish farms. Mm. Instead of harvesting non-renewable yeah. sources, yeah. we can use this. So you, there is a social economic gain. Um, so anybody can have this. So your tiny little, you know, homestead in the middle of nowhere, you can have your little insect farm, you can recycle, you can have this. And although people find it distasteful, the idea of eating insects, what they're doing now is they grind it up into a powder and you can have it in, for example, flour. So you can make pasta out of it and things like yeah. that. Yeah, oh, we, ate, we ate various versions at Dr. Bainan's. Is that Dr. Bainan's yeah, yeah. bug farm? Yeah, uh, and uh, all of it was really palatable. And it was cooked into quite fancy things. It was made into actually little little crunchy snacks. Um, and actually, I, I I didn't mind it at all. It's the the, well, the thought beforehand yeah. was much worse. Well, uh, the thing is, insects are crustaceans. Yeah, there's not much difference. In no, no, there isn't. Prawn. We, they evolved <laughs> from prawns. So you know, you know, kind of yeah. weird. But that's that's the thing. We we are, and I think if you put garlic with anything, it's going to taste yeah. great. So, <laughs> And we, you know, we've been eating uh, two thirds of the world eat insects regularly. There's over 2,000 species of insects we consume. And in Africa, if you're lucky, you can eat a kunga cake around Lake Victoria, which <laughs> you may not like the sound of. Um, it's the mass emergence of midges. And when they get these, they, you know, midge nados are erupting up. So then they will go around and try and grab as many as possible, squish them together to make a patty, which is called a kunga cake. And then they fry these and eat these. And they're meant to be really nice. How many midges in a patty? Oh, That's thousands, <laughs> thousands and thousands. They just squash them all together. We've got some in the museum, pretty old. They okay. don't look too tasty, yeah. when we got the ones in our collection. Oh, the patties, all right, yes. wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, yeah. Um, and I guess so well, a couple of the places we've actually heard that the younger generations of um, in the communities are no longer happy to eat insects. It's become too. They've picked up the, the Western idea of it being a disgusting thing to do. Have yeah. you heard of any ways of people being convinced back? Yes, I know of one woman, uh, Dr. Tilly Collins. She's at Imperial and she's working with um, palm weevils. And again, it was in uh, the 
elder part of the community. So obviously they're trying to, palm is a big issue and there's many things and they're trying to figure out how to make it much more sustainable. And this weevil that feeds on them is one of the ways. Now it was traditionally eaten, but as you say, the youngsters, nah, we, we don't want that. We want, we want other food. So they've been working a lot within the community to how to engage the community it because protein wise as well it's amazing and it's yeah. free yeah so um all sorts of fun things they've been doing um cartoons and adverts and shown how to cook with it in different ways and so it's a slowly slowly but yes i know that people are beginning to kind of get back into doing that <laughs>